welcome. This journey has been going on for 39 episodes. And today we have episode number 40. My name is Venu Gopal and I'm the CEO of Ideascape. And we've been running the My First Job podcast for eight months or more. And in each session, we come up with a guest. We meet a guest, we talk to a person who has had a long and interesting journey in a career that could be along conventional lines or unconventional. Today, we have someone who makes cheese in Chennai. I mean, can you believe it? This is the, uh, you know, the tropical city that has summers for nine months in a year. You would think that cheese is a European product and so it flourishes in Europe. But here's someone who thought differently and decided to embark on a journey that has changed her life and the lives of several people that she interacts with. I have the pleasure of welcoming Namrata Sundareshan to this episode. Hello. Welcome, Namrata. Thank it's you a pleasure so to have you on the show. And you've had a wonderful journey in the last eight years from 2015. Thank you, Venu. Yes, the, the journey sort of started in 2015 because my first brush with cheese making was in 2015. But Kesa started okay. almost two years after that. We started experimenting oh. with some cheese making and I'll, you know, it happened because of a very dear friend um, who is into social work. Anu is not there. I would, you know, I would really liked her to be here today. Anu and I are right. partners with Kesa. So, so okay. yeah, it's seven years now. Okay. So then why don't we start with, you know, most of us have had our brush with cheese in the form of pizzas. I didn't even know that it was mozzarella <laughs> that went on top. We are a paneer nation. You know, in most cases, when you go into a North Indian restaurant, the only thing you get is loads and loads of paneer dishes with a couple of mixed vegetables thrown in for good measure. So yeah. how did you even think that you could convert people to cheese? I well, I did not, you know, much okay. unlike what I came from 15 years of consulting, where everything is very well researched, structured, documented. Cheese making actually just happened along the way. And it just felt okay. very natural. It just happened. But you know, before I jump into that story and how this happened, I'll address just a few of the things you've already mentioned. One is okay. Chennai, tropical, hot country, how do we, I mean, city and how do we have cheese? And the second thing was paneer, because I think it's very important to address those two things. Uh, okay. One is cheese making as a craft is almost 18,000 years old. It's wow. not. And uh, it started with the domestication of animal. And the first milking animal that was domesticated was not a cow, but a sheep. Okay. Yeah. So the first known cheese is also a sheep milk cheese, which was discovered by accident. But interestingly, it is what we call the fertile crescent or in warmer places, you know, the Egypt, Israel, that, that whole belt, that is where okay. domestication happened. That is where cultivation happened. That is where cheese making happened. It traveled much later. It, I, in fact, believe it was the Roman Empire, which made cheese really popular. Uh, wars okay. have been fought over cheese, but cheese came to Europe much later. Okay. And probably the first okay. cheese factory in Switzerland, only around the 1885, 1875 in that time. So a lot of cheese making that we associate, you know, it's almost like I think mountains have got that romanticism, whatever they do. Yes. We all, especially people living in the plains or by the sea, we love to see, but we always yeah. dream of the mountain. Yeah, so we kind right. of associate cheese making with this really cold, nice European vibe, but not true. <laughs> Tropics is where the heat is and microbes, which are at the heart of okay. cheese making, they thrive. Yeah. Uh, okay. We call them, if we don't understand them, we call them germs. But then without microbes, I think there is no real food fermentation. There fermentation. is no. Yeah. 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 So, and almost, almost every, our pickles and everything is actually a result of fermentation. Beer that we would love to drink in hot Chennai summer yep. is also fermentation. Yeah. And cheese is no different. So, Okay. So cheese. So what is your childhood like? I, I mean, I've heard you say that um, on a couple of other interviews that you're always very curious. 
and then you specialize in industry i mean in uh, management and international business international business so that's yes. a, which is a long way from food but <laughs> you some of got drawn back no so i was very clear i wanted to study okay. food and this is this is when i was completing my 12 that i must it so yeah you asked about my childhood so i have to tell you this so i have you know i've lost my dad it's been 10 years but i have i've come from lovely parents um and my father had this thing hanging in the house it's still somewhere there that i'm the boss of the house but i have my wife's permission to say so <laughs> he put it out very yeah. proudly and it made it very clear to me and my younger brother that i'm the provider i love you and i love you with all my heart but when it comes to mom she has the final word because she is the one who's okay. looking after you and bringing you up my mom came from this family of class 1 officers very proud went to a really beautiful college my dad came from zamindar family but was self made he lost his parents very young so he was he was this free spirit full of joy everything worked so he always told us that you know a blinkins dad has had told him that you can be the grass cutter but strive to be the best grass cutter in the us it doesn't matter what you end up becoming but for my mother yeah. she was very clear she wanted my brother to be an engineer like my father and me to be a doctor and i think my okay. first essay when i came home and said what is my aim in life i am supposed to write she said, of course to be a doctor i think along the way i figured out that i did not want to be a doctor but i did not have the courage to tell her so so i still remember after my 12th okay. when i said i want to study hotel management she's like you want to clean bathrooms that was the first <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my cousins on the maternal side were in the iims and rcs and i so she's like no you cannot disappoint your family like this you have to be a doctor but i think fate intervened i did not get through in the first chance that papa stood up for me and said i do not want her wasting her time let her figure out what next and so i went on to do an mba and things so the thing i think what is really different is i have loved i i, I have never said that i have a job i have absolutely enjoyed what i do so research gave me access to a whole lot of travel um i used to travel and international business again i had my own company i worked for a few companies small big uh, that sort of gave me this whole thing to see the world and yes i was curious because um food is how i would explore the world the first thing i would want to do is eat local food what do you eat uh, in fact my i i go on treks every year and then i keep asking the trek guy is this edible do you guys eat it do what do you eat so people think i'm perpetually hungry but i'm not <laughs> <laughs> okay just... but let's go back a little bit to your first job what is your first job like because we're calling this the first job and we know that it'll never stop at the first job but invariably that is one of the points at which you catapult yourself from learning to working So, so what my, was the first job and do you have some memories around that oh i i do my first paid job was a management trainee in a large uh, public sector company in dal which was steel manfa and i was a okay. human resource ma- so i i specialized in marketing and hr and again you know when i okay. was doing that my mother thought hr is a great choice for a woman at least <laughs> so i'm like okay fine you know what training and development sounds like fun and i was there and then i realized that i was somewhere like way below in the rank and completely insignificant because nobody wanted me to bring about any change i thought that you know i was there in this last organization because things were not working out i have to save them i'll bring around changes all that i did for 6 months was study labor laws <laughs> i was done and i said okay you know what next let's explore marketing i've got some skill there um that's when in fact i came to chennai and uh, i worked with dish net dsl the starting days of uh, uh, the dsl or high speed broadband and it was really okay. exciting because it was a new tech and i think um, the company itself was quite progressive um are you talking of dish net dsl yes ha ah, so because yeah. in mudra we worked on the account from there <laughs> ah okay so i was one of the first <laughs> so, so we may have crossed paths at some point <laughs> could have yeah i mean i know we were working yeah. with onm at that point when i was yeah, yeah. and i was uh, yeah. part of the core marketing team that was started in chennai okay. and okay. so it was really interesting after that i went to do um, you know work with a company that was starting the wave of market research outsourcing so i'm talking okay. about early 2000 when uh, market research outsourcing was becoming like a big thing 
and I went right. to Gurgaon, worked with this company, went on to work with Frost. But I think, I think all these, what I'm trying to say is all these places that I worked with fed my curiosity in certain ways. Right. There was okay. something new to discover. There was, um, it was interesting. It was either new, it was uh, research also entailed that you're working on a new topic every other day. You're researching, okay. someday you're researching on water problems in Mexico or, you know, or avocados in California. Or it could be anything. <laughs> Obviously, we cater to a okay. lot of global client. Um, I started my own thing, my first company in 2006. And... Okay. Uh, that was again cross-border research and investment that's what i sort of knew um so travel and international business gave me this whole introduction into the wide world of food and different cuisine and um people and that how similar we can be despite all the dissimilarities and food was somewhere at the heart of it so right flat, coming 2015, I had just taken a vacation and this was in Kunur. It's a beautiful farm run by um, the director Mansoor Ali Khan and his wife. So they live oh, in Kunur. Okay, okay, yeah. And I've he, heard, yeah. Um, you know, he was also writing his, uh, Mansoor was writing his second book. He's written this book called Third Wave, which is about the uh, finite resources in this world, right? And how we're consuming. Right. Um, and uh, a very interesting place. And they had 13 cows at that time. And because 13 okay. cows meant that there would be surplus milk, they used to make some cheese. Uh, his wife, Tina, uh, managed a small creamery. And I said, you know what? I like to cook. I love to cook, in fact. Uh, can I learn how to make cheese? And um, she said, sure, yeah, you can sign up and we can do a... So I did one day and two days and then three days. Uh, it was great. It was really good fun. Uh, but it was just that, you know, you watch cheese making, you know, there was no, there was no science behind it or explaining. It was more like a recipe. It was like attending a cooking class. Right. And for me, the idea was never to come back and make cheese. But the whole thing was that, oh, one dinner party, I'm going to try making my own mozzarella and surprise my guests. And that would be really cool. Okay. So I still remember when I was leaving the place, Mansoor walked up to me and said, you corporate people, you come here, you learn cheese making and you want to go back and start a multi crore company. So, you know, Mansoor, I'm very happy doing what I'm doing. Cheese making is the last thing on my mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, I come back and within about four months, a friend's wife calls me and says, hey, you know what? We're setting up a little baking unit. Uh, so Anu, who is my business partner, Anuradha, she's the one. Okay. So I, I knew her husband, Praveen. Uh, I'm sure you know Praveen Shekhar. Everybody seems to know Praveen Shekhar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. With he with the yes, marketing absolutely. guru with the moustache. Yes, yes. The same. Yeah. So Praveen and right. I go way back. So Praveen said, hey, Anu okay. is doing this. Can you help her? Because I'm this friend. If you're doing anything related to food, you call me. Whether it's okay. to eat somewhere or... So I said, sure. And uh, when I met Anu, she said, uh, so Anu has a social works background. She works with people who are differently able, trains them on different okay. job skills. So she was working with a bunch of girls with hearing impairment and wanted to set up a, a small bakery or train them on baking skills. And um, you know, I jumped in and said, why bake You know, sugar and maida? Who wants to eat more cakes? Uh, <laughs> there are enough people making cake. Let's make cheese. And I still remember. <laughs> Anu looking at me and saying, mm, yeah, but you know, who will eat cheese? What do we do with cheese? And how will it help the girls? I said, see, if they don't have to, we don't have to do this for them to find a job elsewhere. Let's set up a small cheese making unit. Um, and okay. she said, okay, let me think about it. And, you know, we sort of left it at that. Um, but soon after she called me and said, hey, why not? Let's try it out. So she had a full-time job. I had my thing. And I'll travel around quite a bit. So I said, um, sure. So I would come in. We would get evening milk from a um, local milkman. And so interestingly, what I had discovered between this time is that you cannot make cheese from packet milk. And uh -huh. by packet milk, I, I mean the one that arrives at our doorstep. The one that is morning. mixed. Okay. Yeah, it's not only about mixing. It's not milk anymore. It's not the milk that the animal gave you. It's gone through oh, okay. a lot of process. It's um, gone through. So milk primarily is a lot of water and has got sugars, fats, proteins, all 
free molecules roaming around there, which make about 10 to 12 percent of solid. Yeah. So uh, to take those solids out or to work with them for cheese, they need to be in a certain state. Whereas when they go okay. through ultra high heat pasteurization, not only do the microbes get killed, but a lot of structure of the protein is destroyed. So you can't okay. really make cheese with it anymore because there is a chemical alteration that has happened. And then fat is taken out, something is added in. It's gone through a whole lot of transition. So I said, oh, you know, it didn't work. So maybe we need raw milk. We need like pure milk. So we found a source. We found some milk, started making cheese. Two of the girls were then getting trained. Um, and during one of those times, we got a call saying, hey, you people make cheese. Why don't you come for a pop-up market? And I don't know how the word got around, but very exciting. And it was being done by Karen Anand who is somebody that I admired a lot. She's a known name in the food, uh, gourmet food scene in India. So we went into the market at Phoenix. It was amazing. In two days, we had, you know, a couple of hundred people come and try the cheese. Hardly knew anything about cheese making, but we did ma manage to make some cheese. And people were loving it. So we How said, many okay, days did you have to make it? Sorry, how many uh, days did you have to make the cheese? We had a week. We had a week and we made about that was enough. Kilos. I always assumed that cheese required weeks and months. No, but it was not aged. I didn't know how to age cheese. Okay. It was all fresh cheese. You know, things like okay. um, feta and cottage cheese. And so cottage cheese is not paneer, but like the European style cottage cheese. Uh, some mozzarella, cream cheese. And then they were whipped up into different concoctions. So I'd bake some cheesecake. Uh, some were made into dips. So we had a whole lot of things, but the base cheese was just two or three. Um, okay. And we went to this market, there was great response, but then we had made a lot of cheese, so there was also a lot of leftover. And then I tried figuring out how do we do that? Why, how do we just not throw it away, but try to do something? Uh, this was end of 2016. And I think one thing got, you know, we became, suddenly we became this brand and we had a brand logo and website overnight. Uh, we started getting calls from people saying, hey, we have a show coming up. So between 2016 to say 2017 for a year, Anu and I would do at least two or three pop-ups every week. Oh, okay. It was a lot, there was a lot happening in Chennai. So we were yeah, just- Yeah, there was a lot, that's a lot of work. Some, yeah, it was it was a lot of work, but it was fun. You know how it is when you do something, and then somebody it's like the inner child in you walking up and saying, "Oh my God, this is amazing! You people are doing such a great job. This is so tasty." And for me, you know, honestly, making something and feeding people is something that makes me really happy. So when okay. people enjoy what I have made, I think that's like, oh wow, it's this is great. <laughs> so there was that thing as well. And on when I would just we would pack the cheese, take a standy, go to this place get orders, make more cheese. And, you know, we had this catchy name, eat more cheese was our tagline. So, <laughs> so it was it was all very nice. But then I think somewhere along the line, I also started thinking that, um, what next? Um, I mean, I, I almost felt, you know, the imposter syndrome that they talk about, right? So, okay, I'm doing this, but I don't know if something goes wrong. What do I do? Okay. Because I really don't know enough. Um, I started reading books and I think somewhere around my 12th or 13th book, I found somebody called David Asher and his okay. book was very different. You know, it was almost like this book that spoke to me, talked about cheese in a very different light. Um, so I wrote to him and I said, um, I'm a cheese maker and I want to learn from you and how do we do this? And so he said, um, well, I'm a traveling cheese maker. I teach all over the world, uh, but I'm in British Columbia. I'm doing these classes. And then he had a class for um, schedule in Vermont in the U.S. So okay. I, have, I lived in the U.S. very briefly. So I'm sort of familiar. I have a lot of cousins and I could figure my way around. And I said, great, I'm coming. Um, okay. And I think that was a turning point because that actually gave him, uh, I mean, gave me this whole insight into what cheese making really is. David is somebody who's traveled the world, learned cheese making as an ancient tradition from many different cultures. And that is okay. what he is able to give to his students. Okay. Uh, personally, for me, I think what has happened, I mean, because I told you I had the, I had the consulting thing, that was going on great and that, that was there. Um, so in 2013, um, 
so I'm uh, very close to my dad. And I think 2013 Feb is when we lost him. And it was, uh, as a family, we were very close. But losing him was like this, you know, we were all dealing, as in me, my brother and my mother, we were all learning how to deal with it or we're trying to deal with it. Um, so I sort of let a lot of things slip away from me. Um, okay. In the sense, I just could not focus on work. I could not do anything. Um, I wanted to be around for my mother. Primarily, she li lives in Odessa. Uh, oh, I'm from Odessa. My husband, my okay. Sundaresan part of my name is my husband. Uh. <laughs> He's from Salem. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and uh, okay. so, so, yeah, so it was a very difficult time. So between the 2013 to 2016, I mean, I was a person who was always focused on work, but I just could not bring myself to center myself. And I was struggling with a lot of things. But you know, when I started making cheese, and this is something that I have told very few people, but working with your hands and when you're creating something, I, I think there's something very magical about it. It's therapeutic. Yeah. It also helps you center. Uh, right. So for me, the whole cheese making became a very personal journey where I found myself, it, it's almost like finding my way back into the world. Well, for me, that is what happened. Um, yeah, because I mean, no, I, still... and, no I think that's wonderful, uh, Namrata, because I think with that, you kind of have explained how this untapped passion sort of revealed itself in phases to you. So the Mansoor uh, Ali uh, experience, like you said, was more of a cooking class. But at some point, I think because you were searching, you also found David Usher. Yeah. What was the David Usher class like? How many days was that course? It was. Or how it long was, was that course? It, you know, it was like a 10 day thing, but okay. it, it was not a cheese making class. You know, he so in cheese making, there are, if you look at ingredients, for example, there's milk, right. there are cultures, think of them right. as yogurt, yeah, the tire that we make right. every day at home. There is rennet, which is an enzyme, and there's salt. We had days talking about what is milk, how can milk be different, different kinds of milk. We would work with different kinds of milk. We were in a this beautiful set place called the New American School of Farmstead, um, where Students come to learn lumbering, apiary, permaculture, and things like that. Um, it was snowing. It was the winter of 20, 2018. Um, we're learning about rennet, about salt, discussing what salt can do, learning about microbes. So it wasn't a recipe. It was about mm. learning each and every crucial ingredient, and there were not so many of them. And eating and drinking. I mean, David had a lot of cheese from all over the world. So every day we would look forward to that 3 o'clock when he would open a couple of bottles of wine and have this amazing cheese. It was wine, cider, beer, and a whole lot of things we talk about pairing right. them. But most of it just enjoyed as a group. There were 15 of us. Uh, I, I was the one. So people were complaining about traveling from Michigan or Seattle. And here I was saying, I've come from India. Like, OK, you are Indian, we can see. But where did you come from? Like, I actually came from India. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay. So, I, I mean, you know, so David, I mean, I always, I call him my guru and I maintain this journal, which I showed him the last time that I met him as well, which which says life after being Asherized. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, in okay. a lot of ways, he's the one. When I came back after learning with David, I would say, um, you know, hi, I'm, a, I'm Namrata, I'm a cheese maker. Before that, I would okay. always struggle to say, okay, how do I introduce, what do I say? Am I really a cheese maker? Uh, but he sort of gave me that it was it was not giving me a recipe or recipes for cheese, but he enabled me to be able to become the cheese maker I want to be. So today wow. when I That's... when I teach people, I, yeah. I tell them that you no, know, when I when I learned from David, I almost felt like it's a gift and that gift cannot be just with me, it needs to pass on. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> no, the wonderful thing is that. When you're looking, you find people almost assume that, you know, it's it's just something that happens by chance. There is chance, but there is a point at which you're 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 actively seeking. Oh, absolutely. And that's the point at which you 
you sort of get to find and like i love the way you said you read through so many books and you found the one book that spoke to you yeah yeah this is one thing that i tell people about reading that don't read a book read to people who speak to you oh you absolutely. know because you will find what you're uh, what you're really interested in only by listening it's like you make friends with certain people because they speak to you and you get along with them there are lots of people that you could meet but not have a conversation for more than 5 or 10 minutes true whereas there are people you can sit and talk to for hours and you just don't know time go by yeah and, and, and you just feel like you know them from you know it's not like yes. you met them for the first time yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> we like, are having one of that conversation now <laughs> exactly i mean i've met you 15 minutes ago or 20 minutes ago yeah but that's the i think that's the wonderful part about what we you know chanced upon with this itself we first started saying okay we'll do my first job but then the whole career journey is what i find uh so interesting because each one has had different plot points on that journey yeah, yeah. and it's even if you're in the same business how it evolves and what your motivations are can be quite different so it's not about uh, you know the same so now when it comes to why would we do a little uh, you know you've had a background in marketing so at some point you also see that this has to be a business yes so <laughs> we, <laughs> so the pop ups are one part but how have you gone about uh, you know and i understand that this is a product to which you either find people who already know about the product which is why they buy it but in most indian households like you said it's only amul cheese or cubes which are bought so how do you see change happening and where do you see that role being played so the couple of different things to it right so six years back when i started out and it was i think it was really important so for me i came from a background like i said which is very structured um yeah a, a, any of the business my approach to my work in consulting was extremely structured research oriented because there's no other way that's how you do a really good job right um when i got into cheese making it was completely open ended they were uh, also it's such a new thing in india so okay, there are some cheese makers who have been around since 1980s uh there is a brand called carousel there is skoda cheese but they were this typical mountain brands that we know about and if you happen to go to kodai you go to a kodai cheese and buy today they are available at stores but i'm talking about even 6 7 years back you couldn't buy you couldn't go to a market and ask for a artisanal brand of cheese if you go to right. a supermarket like uh, amanana in chennai for example you can buy a lot of imported cheese or you have the amuls so there were two stark categories and there was nothing in between uh 2016 in a lot of 2013 2014 in a lot of ways is the starting of this wave of artisanal cheese makers that you see in india and not cheese as such but cheese makers because um individuals like me who are well traveled have a good palate have had cheese and have seen the opportunity so by the way we are the world's largest dairy producing company i mean uh, producing country our dairy huh. volume of dairy is yeah, highest that's... right yeah but cheese is not a product i mean we would think of india and ghee and paneer and uh, paneer again is not paneer is a relatively modern day food like you said to, okay. you, you know you mentioned in your introduction as well that uh, you can go to any place any vegetarian place or any place any restaurant for example and you will find at least five four different dishes of paneer i mean there is a yeah. pakoda masala you know this thing in and, and it's not restricted to north indian it's any south indian i mean you'd be surprised to go to even a kunur or a kurg or places like this and you ask them to be that yeah paneer manchurian paneer butter masala and it's become this thing interestingly paneer is not like a ancient indian thing paneer hmm. was made in india only when the portuguese came into india with uh, vinegar that is when we okay. started curdling milk we always made yogurt we mm. made ghee we made khoya and these things and there is also historical evidence that we made cheese about 5000 odd years back uh okay with the pastoral communities in gujarat they have found traces of now i think the reason why we stopped making cheese at least in the plains in the mainland is because cheese making always involved an enzyme 
that was derived from uh, the stomach of a young animal. So because of the uh, okay. Vedic society and the pureness of food and everything, it's believed that possibly cheese making just went out. So you still see cheese making the fringes, which is in Sikkim, uh, Gujars, who are a particular tribe in uh, Kashmir, they make it. But in the mainland, you have no more cheese. So coming back to as recent as 2013, 2014 cheese makers, and there were a couple of them. So 2016, 2017, the kind of questions that people would ask me was very different. It was limited to one question. How do I eat it? Okay. I, I could just not get it because I just think you just eat it. Like, why do I? And where they were coming from is the only application of cheese that people knew is to make a sandwich or a pizza or something. How else do you eat it? Because cheese is always an accessory. You know, it's a right. glamour thing that you add. And if you right. if you are fancy and travel and you want to make cheese sauce, a bechamel or white sauce or whatever you add to it. And so my thing was that no, it's you know, it's a really good piece of cheese. Just enjoy it with if you want something, a cracker or a fruit. But what I also realized that that was a very Western way. It's not something that we were used to. Right, but but then living in a place like Chennai, you of course have expats, you have people who are well traveled. So and coming from the background that I do, I would sit and draw consumer profiles, and I knew that there were five or six very distinct consumer profile. They were looking for different things. Yeah. Okay. So if I made fresh cheese and I I have somebody who's an expat, and like oh you, you don't have a cheddar. There are some people who cook something exotic at home and they say you don't have a parmesan. You know, so what cheese are you <laughs> making? So it, it was this very different. But then now where we stand, people are asking today, especially people asking, oh, so where do your cows graze? Where's the milk coming from? Is it? Okay. They're no longer asking A2. I'm glad that is over because that was such a sham. <laughs> okay. so today they're asking what breed of cows? How long is the milk traveling? Where are you getting this from? You know, what kind of bacteria ferments are you using my goodness the questions are so much more evolved okay yeah. okay and it's it's and i have seen how consumer segment those same consumers have evolved as well right today there is access to information i think in a lot of ways covid also gave everybody that time so a lot of people have been uh, able to get access to a lot more information it was just there content was being created people were listening to more things I think they were in a better frame of mind to grasp a lot more <laughs> and also right. got involved with the food a little more. So, okay. so the whole consumer thing has evolved. How is, um, you know, do you think that the Indian palate, as opposed to the Western and European palate, are there Indian dishes into which cheese can come in naturally? Like you've heard of cheese parottas where people put it in, but what are the foods with which, you know, you can use cheese for cooking in India? I don't know have, if you have come across a Molaga Podi cheese. I don't know if you have. No, but I haven't. We, we <laughs> like I told you, I, there's a whole lot of things I'll have to do after this podcast. <laughs> so we have, we have this young cheddar that's beautiful, crisp, nutty, fresh flavors, but it's coated with a nice, spicy, crunchy uh, Molaga Podi, right? It's Whoa. it's great on dosa. It melts Perfect. beautifully. It's oh, it adds the cheesiness. It's amazing. I mean, and I have parents walking up to me like young kids saying, "You know what? The cheese in the panyaram is amazing." I put crumbled feta <laughs> into my panyaram. So then, you are only limited by your imagination. Cheese can okay. go in anywhere, but the beauty of cheese is that it doesn't have to. It can just be a meal by itself. Uh, in the sense, so if you if you're eating a piece of cheese. A 50 gram piece of cheese, of a hard cheese, will give you your required protein intake for that particular meal. It's really yeah. high protein, right? So, so you just have to have a piece of cheese. You can have it with the fruit, have it with a little jam. I mean, there are many different variations. There are many flavor combinations. The reason I talk about a jam or a fruit or something is always a little sweetness or something else. Herbs help you elevate the cheese. So pairing is again a very interesting thing. I mean, you can have it with a piece of chocolate, like a dark cheese, dark cheddar, a cheddar with a dark chocolate is a great combination as well. So 
there are many ways that you can experience your chi so i think that is what i also do i do a lot of experiential uh, pairing and talking about it uh, it's not just making the cheese but uh, helping the consumer understand cheese better yeah, yeah? so yeah. you know they in they call um, in alcohol they have this something called alcohol advocacy where people go and talk about alcohol and so i do cheese advocacy <laughs> when <I> talk about <laughs> why cheese why should you eat more cheese and you know how does it help you and yeah no in fact even like you spoke of alcohol and india used to be a place we looked upon scotch as the single mall or the single malls as the biggest and now you have i think the it companies especially they found some of the people coming from there and then asking hey can i take an amrut back so you know it was the first thing that otherwise you stopped over at a place and decided to pick up a couple of bottles and they actually coming over here and goa apparently is a great place for aging uh, you know alcohol faster which you know all of these are so counterintuitive because when you first hear of these things you say hey what is it that i don't know or there are so many things that you take for granted which have just become i think yeah. this is this lovely series by michael polan he talks about i think he starts with uh, you know the cool. four series of cooking yes it's yeah, the cool. roasting the fermentation and yeah. then the frying and finally yeah. the yeah uh, steaming Air, water, so fire earth it's yeah, the four which is, and everybody yeah. should read that book it's for it's a book and a series yeah. that it's amazing yeah it's it's yeah. one of my first recommendation to all my students <laughs> it's called cooked yeah Okay so Polan is uh, yeah he's always been one of those people who's able to capture the essence of what eating oh, is absolutely. about because you think it's just yeah. words but uh, you know he has no, this no, amazing his, ability uh, to put things in words yeah his botany of desire where he talks about uh, his yeah. yeah where he talks about mm-hmm. how plants make you do their doing and not they don't they exactly. make you work for them exactly <laughs> that <laughs> article on perfect. orchids is a classic it's one of yeah. those things that you know it it gives you so many things about how orchids have managed to sort of live through every kind of yeah, yeah. uh oh, i'm so glad you brought a mind pollen i would have mentioned it <laughs> <laughs> no that's uh, that's absolutely wonderful so i mean do you think at some point that this is like a natural progression or do you think a career is something that one tends to experiment with in your case it very clearly it it didn't start off with saying okay i want to be a cheese maker like you said it was a point a revelation at a certain point in time so true. what is it with people you know it's often the identity is a designation true and and which is what i was telling you sometime back that for me i think i have today when i look back i think of that as a privilege of sorts because i was able to jump and experiment with a lot of things um right. but i think you were talking about seeking you know what you seek is seeking you but to figure out seeking takes time but i think what is most important is to be open to receiving because most of the times we are uh, not right right um we grow up so structured and we think right. that the definition of a career is this you need to have right. a job to earn a living but i think somewhere we forget that we're going to spend a good part of our life actually doing that activity and there needs to be some joy in it and it's not just a job by by i mean i i'm told a lot of times by friends and family that you need to have a life like people i have a life i have a great life <laughs> just because i enjoy what i do doesn't mean that yeah. i'm always working so let's not let's not put brackets like saying oh you are a workaholic like, because you're working that working is a very right. integral part of us and yes we do look for identity we look for affirmations we look for all of that somehow in the outside in the designation is sometimes what we strive for but that's not what it is right you right. need to be doing something that actually brings you i mean i think joy is very underrated and in my younger worship even i believe that happiness is very mediocre you it's success and not happiness i have, i have right. that in my diary is written down that you know who wants happiness you need to be successful you need to achieve i didn't do any better right okay. but today i 
I think this is what I tell people as well, that be open to receiving. It's okay to jump. It's okay to figure out. If you don't like it, move on. Because, see, I think more than what it was 20 years back, today I think it's pretty easy to earn. Right. It's not, it's not difficult to earn a living. Right. Also, we have so many different things that you can experiment. You could have a side hustle. You can figure out something. You can read. And knowledge is not just through the books. I mean, today you have so much that's available to you. You were talking about not knowing so many things. And I think that's always true, right? Because learning is constant. And yeah. it's not just what we learn at school. Every single day you can keep your mind open to, oh my God, even this can happen. Right. But so I think I think that needs to be that thing towards a career as well. Let's not make it so straight jacketed and so narrow in our approach saying, okay, today I join as a marketing executive, tomorrow I'm a manager, day after senior manager, then a VP. You know, that's that's yeah, basically yeah. probably has got its own merit. But it has, yeah. yeah. And for people who are happy with that, maybe that's yeah. you know. If, the difference, I think, is in whatever you said is curiosity. At a certain point, people stop being curious and then look at the other trappings. Whereas you are exploring, and I think that's a wonderful counterpoint where you said you should be open to receive. So I think at some point that port is closed. <laughs> and we do you it know? ourselves, right? It's not that somebody yeah, else. We're doing it ourselves. We're we not doing it by. But there is one aspect of cheese as opposed to paneer. Mm -hmm. it smells strong, right? Yes. Or is it, yes. again, am I being, uh, you know, judgmental again? No, no, it's true. So, so Pani, yeah. what does Pani smell like? Pani smells like milk. Yeah, right. What does milk smell like? We love the smell of fresh milk as such because right. of the thing, character we call lactic. You're smelling the sugar, right? right? right. So when, when Basundi is made at home or you're just boiling milk, the sugars are getting caramelized and you are smelling sweetness. Right. As human beings, we gravitate towards that sweet smell. That is what we do. Right. But uh, so in paneer, so let's say like uh, the milk solids are the fats, sugar and protein. When we make paneer, we bring the milk to boil. We add an acid, which is a vinegar or a lemon or whatever, and we curdle it and extract the solid from the liquid. Yeah. So which means that the sugar in the paneer is intact. Yeah. Right? So paneer is actually quite close to, to milk. Now, in cheese making, it's very different. In cheese making, what you're doing is you're acidifying. Now, what I mean okay. by acidification is you are letting the microbes eat the sugar. So cheese, the okay. first step of cheese making is something called ripening or acidification, where you right. introduce the microbes to start eating the sugar that is available and convert that into lactic acid. That becomes a food for the microbes right. again. Then the proteins are being broken down to amino acid and the fats to fatty acid. Now, fatty acids are brilliant because they, um, you know, they're aromatic. Give out. Right. right. So cheese will always be smellier, acidic. Uh, and I work with a lot of pastoral communities, people who have no idea of cheese. The first learning experience with them was hilarious because people thought uh, when you're making the cheese and aging it for a couple of months, there was one of my cheese makers who went around telling the whole community that we're going to have Mysore Park ready in three, three months time. <laughs> <laughs> and he had his first bite of the cheese and I could see that he just wanted to spit it out. He's like, this is the pulik, it's not, it's not, why is it tasting sour? Why is it, I mean, you know, he just could not understand what happened to the sugar. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> so cheese making is very different from paneer. Paneer will only smell of milk and sweet and nicer, will always be more pleasant. Whereas cheese will never, so just the cream cheese or the really fresh cheeses will smell lactic or slightly sweet. Yeah. But then from the second day onwards, they're only going to smell acidic or sour. So, okay. and then eventually quite smelly. So, isn't uh, so cheese is largely a very acquired taste you have to keep experimenting to finally fall in love with it or is it something that you see is acquired over time i think that's true for our palate right our palate okay. and we train up like a lot of us i've seen people 
who are close to trying out new things even you travel if, when you travel you would uh, um, for example i was in the us for some time and this is a company from chennai a global company they had headquarters there and a bunch of us would travel and if there are 50 people there would be at least 20 who will carry sambar powder rasam powder um, you know rice dal everything from here because they want sambar sadam and tar sadam and even for the north indians so they would want their dal chawal every day you know i don't want to be going and eating that food available outside every day so it's not about eating out it's about trying something new it's right. about so your if you let your palate try a lot of different things you learn to acquire it i mean with drinking wine also i mean who would like drinking wine from the first day i remember getting my brother a bottle and he had it and said so it tastes like camelin ink so is how do you know what ink tastes like <laughs> I mean, today he can rattle off about all wine regions and what grows where and what happens, and he loves his wine. So I think it's it's acquired. It is true that it's yeah. acquired, but it's also that you need to be able to experiment with young cheeses or sort of low mature cheeses like a cheddar and a gouda, and those kind of things are pleasant. There is no sharpness, sharpness to it as such. As cheese matures okay. and as cheese makers, we also like I was saying, cheese making is a very traditional. Technique. Different places in world have done this cheese making, primarily to preserve milk. Yeah, and there okay. are different techniques that are applied. So blue cheese is one of them. Wash. There's something called wash drying, where the cheese can be really stinky. You can smell it from a mile. There is something okay. called a bishop's feet, which is the world's most expensive, one of the most expensive cheeses. Okay. And it, it stinks. It stinks like dirty feet. I mean, that's why it's called Bishop's feet. <laughs> Bishop's feet is not <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. So if like it was it. a journey through your own brand, Kaze, am I spelling yes. it, uh, pronouncing Kaza. it right? Ka- Kaze. Okay. Kaze. Uh, Kaze. Okay. So Kaze, if I was to start experimenting with your range, given an Indian palate, what is the journey that you think would work best where should you start and what our can you get into <laughs> our okay. cream cheese which is the base of our spreads the really beautiful okay. spreadable cheeses that's the first one and then you move on to something like a feta so we do i think what is really special with kaza and uh, in fact last year we that there's something called the world cheese awards that happens globally where about okay. 4300 cheeses come to participate and the top 200 are chosen and the one of wow. our cheese was amongst the top 200 last Fabulous. year fabulous <laughs> thank <laughs> congratulations you. that's thank an amazing you. achievement for 7 years of you know yeah. less than a decade of experience and you've actually aced it at that point wonderful well, i mean it was, it was a it was a pleasant <laughs> surprise but it was really really cool thing so yeah uh, so you start so we are known for infusing flavors we draw a lot of inspiration from india its spices regional thing so i i said i come from odisha right so the turmeric leaf is a big deal right it's used for um making some traditional dishes and then it start now from november and over here in chennai as well during the pongal time all through the it's available to okay. us in many many parts of india use it for steaming things uh, so we use it for covering some of the cheeses and that actually transfers some of those beautiful herbaceous flavors to the cheese so we are known for these flavor infusions and things that we do so yeah with going back to your thing you start with cream cheese uh, you can try the feta there is a feta chili garlic which is again very pleasant mild salty and there is a cheese called halloumi it's actually from cyprus where it's made with golden okay. sheep milk but we make it with cow milk and that's a cheese slice that can be sort of fried uh, pan fried and it's Yum! I mean, I haven't found anyone till date who has said they haven't liked the halloumi. Then you progress to cheddar, gouda, provolone, and then if you're feeling adventurous, you can try some of our wash drying, like a taligio or a blue cheese. And yeah, there are ways to make it pleasant as well. You can try it with a little bit of honey and fig, and you won't feel the sharpness of the cheese. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful, Namrata. I wish. Okay, there's one. question which i don't think i've asked you which is how have you how did you manage to scale in terms of you know yeah so if you could just close out yeah, on that yeah, absolutely then, yeah. 
no i think it's really important because uh, you know again when i started to look this look at this as a business which we did but we gave ourselves a time to figure this out because there was no existing benchmark uh, definitely a large producer like amul is not our benchmark you know we're not right. in that thing and and there were very few artisan cheese producers as such now in the market when there are 30 of them only 3 of us which is including case we have been able to scale and take it to a certain height but what i always thought was uh, you know artisan products can also scale but you just need to look at it slightly differently yeah? it doesn't have to be a model that you need to follow uh, for us social impact has always been a large part of the agenda and whatever we do anu and i got recognized with the nari shakti puraskar just 3 right. years into this 2 years into this journey and because which we is another in- amazing milestone yeah thank you thank you so much yeah so right. so that was for working with women who are differently abled and uh, but as we grew we said you know what not all the cheese making has to happen in chennai there are right. there is amazing milk that's available throughout the country it's going to be difficult because you have to sort out supply chain there is challenge in terms of language going to a different place but we tied up with different partners so samonati is one of the partners then we tied up with a ngo a trust called sahjeevan which works extensively with pastoral communities you know pastoral communities traditionally are the keepers of the livestock and they have incredible quality of milk they have lot of milk now they have a different problem sitting in chennai i'm trying to get really good quality milk for them the problem is that they have incredibly good quality milk but they can't get it to the market because they're really far from the consumer so i started right. working with pastoral communities and we set up little cheese making units where i go engage with them work with them for a year 18 months make cheese train them set up the quality standards everything and then we buy the cheese back from them and bring it to the market so that's how we have been able to scale so as we grew from say 50 60 kilos a month to uh, close to 2000 kilos a month it's not just us but three other companies that are growing with us wonderful what a career story number thank you i mean this is one of those things that uh, you know i what i found is for for me every single episode is a learning i mean there are things which i've never heard of and somehow as opposed to books hearing someone speak about it and then say what they've done seems to break that whole thing down into easily digestible parts and okay. also understand what is involved in building a business so like you said it was a a hobby that became a leap of faith and became something that and i love that line where you said no there are too many bakers so let's go ahead and make some cheese <laughs> <laughs> no offense to the baker <laughs> <laughs> i mean you knew because baking seems to be the thing that is accepted it's a ready market and you opted to take the difficult route which is making cheese where very few people so you found a convert i don't know how quickly <laughs> or how you know fast this journey will be but thank you for taking the time and i think you have really explained in wonderful lucid detail as to what your motivations were and how you applied them any closing thoughts no no thank you so much for having me this was wonderful i mean you know if i i really want more people to get into this and it's not just cheese making today uh, the world is open in a lot of ways whether you want to pursue yeah. something um find a career path that is not conventional it's all there and um, right. yeah i mean i think i always find it a privilege when people reach out and there's a little mentoring that i can do to put something together and help people nudge in a different direction so <laughs> thank you for having me and doing this and please so, come down and try some cheese you must try yeah, some yeah i will <laughs> <laughs> and like you said beautifully don't just seek be willing to receive as well so that is the trick to making things happen <laughs> thank you navrita thank you. it's been a pleasure thank you likewise thank you. have a great day bye that was namrata sundaresan and her journey of making and establishing a cheese brand from the south of india next week another guest please do join us 
to hear about another career journey and where life goes for so many people when they decide that they will receive as well as seek